I started a nonprofit organization following the loss of my son Benjamin on April 16, 2009 to suicide. This organization has a mission to empower our youth to be the change that we all and they want to see in the world. To stomp out the growing trends we're seeing of depression, bullying, and teen suicide. And to provide uh, positive and alternative and powerful channels for expression of the emotions through the arts. This is called Be the Change. My sweet baby child chose to leave this place. He didn't see the point to be part of the human race. He left in a fleeting moment, no longer willing to feel the pain of a lifetime of suffering with a mentally challenged brain. No one will ever know what it was like to be in his skin, dealing with a mental illness that was destined to win. He was deeply tortured from the moment he arrived. I can honestly say I don't blame him for wanting to die. His fears consumed him and snuffed out his light. He no longer had the energy to put up a fight. He soared out of his body, his spirit blazing bright, rising from the ashes of Phoenix, taking flight. He transcended into heaven, shooting straight up to the sun. No doubt, in this mama's broken heart, he's finally safe in the arms of one. His soul is on a new journey. His presence is crystal clear. He's now a radiant angel, finally free of constant fear. He's sharing all of his knowledge. He clearly speaks through me. He's been my greatest teacher and guided me to see. It's time to come together and remember who we are, that each of us is perfect, a divine and precious star. We are starting a revolution to put an end to hate and war, to awaken the hearts within us to judge and hurt no more. The bully's day is over. The ego's time is through. The voice of doubt and separation is no longer our truth. It's caused thousands of hurtful lab it has caused thousands of hurtful labels, a mindset that must change if we are to raise the consciousness so that peace can take the reins. It's time to come together and remember who we are, that each of us is perfect, a divine and precious star. Though our beliefs may all be different, in our centers we're all the same, loving beings of divine light, no more room to project blame. We have a responsibility to ourselves and the God within to be the change that we all seek by no longer allowing fear to win. We are all good loving people when we focus on our hearts. Each of us is perfect, a divine and precious star. Thank you. Uh, this is a piece called uh, The Promise. It's in three parts. I lived a life of blessings rich with family, friends, and loved ones near. Then something changed my life. It took my home and left me standing here, where suddenly a giant chasm opened up in front of me, and I was forced to say goodbye to all I thought I'd ever be. I wandered lonely as a cloud, a universe of empty space where nothing made sense anymore and where I found no resting place. But slowly, out of that darkness, I began to sense a change. I did not know just what it was, but I would never be the same. It was as if I had been dead. Then suddenly, I was alive. It was as though I had to fall 
so I could learn to fly. Last night I had a dream. I had a dream that I could fly. I was followed by a dark and faceless man. He pursued me through the night. I found myself upon a cliff, too scared to climb, afraid I'd fall, sensing his menace growing closer. I suddenly had to risk it all. And so I jumped into the air. I didn't stop to question why. And when I felt my hands cut deep into the wind, I realized that I could fly. And soaring high up through the twilight, toward the sun, how I could see. And then I looked down at that dark and faceless man. That's when I saw that it was me. But that wind just took me higher. It was so warm and sweet and pure. It was the breath of life itself rising from beneath the forest floor. I know you think there's no one out there where you are lost, no one can see. I watch you grip that cold steel rail with all your strength, and still you fall down to your knees. I've seen you raise your eyes to heaven to see just starless black above. I know you feel so far away now from hope, from innocence, from love. I'm here to tell you it's not like that. I've come to say you're not alone. I didn't come this far to leave you. No, I've come to take you home. And my hand's stretching out to reach you. Although right now you cannot see. But you don't have to see to grasp it. You only have to know it's me. It's time for you to come to life. Because you have already died. And you know what it is to fall. Now the time has come for you to fly. Thank you. I would like to read you a poem written by an old friend of mine, Marjorie Swenson. She died in her garden doing what she loved at age 95. And she was a dear friend and she inspired a number of songs that I've written. And uh, when she was a great grandmother at some point, she wrote uh, the Valentine's Day poem I'm going to read. And I think you can get to know the woman by listening to her words. Valentine's Day is not for old or young. I don't know of anyone, yes, anyone, who doesn't like to be told, I love you. All little children, especially the old, a child tears the envelope, pulling out the card to see who sent it. It's not very hard. They laugh and then cry out in their glee, look what someone sent to me. Young lovers try to open theirs, perhaps secretly, away from all stairs. Hearts beat faster as cards are withdrawn. These words here are cherished from night until morn. Words read and reread each time with its thrill that Valentine verses always instill. He loves me, he loves me not, there's no place here, just I love you needs to appear. A wife looks up from her daily chore as the man in her life comes through the door. 
the envelope still in the bag from the stores, she dries her hands as he looks with pride at the woman who'll always be his bride. She smiles. And the kiss and hug she gives as she whispers, I'll love you for as long as I live. Then she reaches high upon a shelf, a tin of his special cookies, all for himself. <laughs> a child comes in many shapes and sizes. The oldest even brings the heart, that wrinkled and colored with crayons red. I love you, nothing else need be said. This card will also be cherished for years. Years pass, but Valentines are here to stay. I'm sure it is always meant to be that way. The wrinkled clasped hands as eyes growing dim. She knows without telling what life means to him. How many years will they have now that they, they can share? It's sad to say, but God has a way to bring more love on Valentine's Day. The hands that tremble, ears with less hearing, days ahead that some may be fearing. Up there, with God, the other will see, this is the way God meant it to be, a life to live to the very end. The old one knows there are days still to spend. Happy Valentine's Day as arms enfold warm loving bodies to hug and to hold. It's heaven's blessing on Valentine's Day. That isn't always the case, others say. I know, but this is my story, my love, my blessings. I'm sure that come from above. My heart beats fast as days go faster. I'm sure this love will be with me hereafter. In my prayers, I'm thankful when each day is done for God's cherished gift, each daughter and son. Happy Valentine's Day from your mother, Nana, and great Nana, who loves you with all of her heart. And that's Marjorie Swenson. You know, they didn't have poetry open mics in the 19th century. So I would like to correct that for one of the great ladies of the past century. I am Julia Ward Howe. I am married to Dr. Samuel Gridley Howe, the director of the Perkins Institute from the Blind. After we were married, I returned from a glorious honeymoon in Europe with our firstborn daughter. But then I had to face life in the Perkins Institute in South Boston. First of all, I, I had a second baby. And then I was, I was a terrible housekeeper and a terrible cook. My father always said to me I should improve my cooking. But I wanted to study German. And Dr. Howe was very critical since he had all of his friends over for a great dinner party every single week. I wanted to study and I wanted to write. Instead, I had two more babies. But then I got to go to Europe. We, we went there with my husband and my two youngest babies and, and then my husband went back to Boston and I remained in Rome. I knew a day of glad surprise in Rome, free, free to the childish joy of wandering. I strayed, amassing wildflowers, ivy leaves, thoughts of unending beauty from the fields. I, I made a new friend and every day he presented me with a bouquet of violets and we discussed philosophy and he listened to my poetry. But then I had to return to Boston to my cross husband and my children and my cares. I, I wanted to to study and to write poetry. I managed to do it secretly in the attic while editing an abolitionist newspaper with my husband. And then I had a book of my poems published. It was called 
passion flowers. And Dr. Howe was furious. A woman's place was only devoted to her husband and her children. She should have no voice at all in the wide world. And this poem particularly stirred his wrath. A miller wanted a mill stream, a mild, efficient brook, to help him to his living in some snug and shady nook. But our miller had a brilliant taste, a love of flash and spray. And so the stream that charmed him most was that of brightest play. It wore a quiet look at times, and steady seemed and still, but when its quicker depths were stirred, wow, but it wrought its will. The miller toiled with might and main, builded with thought and care, and when the spring broke up the ice, the water wheel stood there. Like a frolic maiden come from school, the stream looked out anew. The happy miller bowing said, Now turn, my mill wheel, do! Your mill wheel, cried the naughty nymph. That would indeed be fine. You have your business, I suppose. Learn, too, that I have mine.
Sometimes in my songs, um, I borrow, with permission, poetry from my friends. And uh, Suzanne Fudette, who is an artist, um, recently wrote a poem about winter. And I loved it, and I called it Infinite Blue. And in this poem and in this song, um, we are talking to the ocean. Silver clouds on a November day, winter in waiting as the tide slips away. We're walking with my ocean, she listens to me with her waves unfolding, arms opening to me, and I.
I'm Dr. Nancy Rappaport. Suicide is a difficult topic to discuss, but one that needs open communication. Suicide is the third leading cause of death among 10 to 24 year olds, and it's on the minds of far too many young people. A national survey of high school students discovered that one in seven said that they were seriously considering taking their own lives. Deaths from suicides are only part of the problem. Every year, some 150,000 youth receive emergency care for self-inflicted wounds. Suicide leaves family and friends shocked and confused with unanswered questions about what might have been done to avoid such tragedies. Research has allowed us to identify risk factors, warning signs, causes of suicide, and strategies for prevention. Visit the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention at AFSP.org to learn more. I'm Dr. Kathy Phillips. And I'm Dr. Andrew Blum. Epilepsy is the third most common neurological disorder in the United States after Alzheimer's disease and stroke. It affects more than 3 million people, with 200,000 new cases diagnosed each year. The condition is caused by a temporary disturbance in brain function, resulting in various kinds of seizures. These seizures can produce involuntary movements, changes in awareness, altered behavior, or loss of consciousness. Epilepsy is a major chronic medical condition and can affect a person's quality of life similar to arthritis, heart disease, diabetes, or cancer. It can limit activity and cause pain, anxiety, or depression. It can also be life-threatening. Because epilepsy can also present non-medical challenges such as discrimination and social stigma, we urge you to learn more about this condition. To find out more about this disorder, including its symptoms, diagnosis, and treatment, visit epilepsyfoundation.org.